Passiamo ad una relazione molto, molto attesa eh, del professor Misko Kubrinowski dell'Università di Canterbury, New Zealand, che ci parlerà del, degli impatti, dei fenomeni di, di, di liquefazione avvenuti nel 2010-2011 eh, a Christchurch e ci parlerà anche dei progetti eh, di eh, riabilitazione eh, messi in campo in quell'occasione. Prego, professore. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Apologies, first of all, for not being able to deliver this presentation in Italian, but I hope that uh, my slides and photos will do the job for me because many of those actually do not need words. I will be happy to share our experiences with uh, the recent earthquakes that hit Christchurch in New Zealand, and in particular the effects that liquefaction caused in those earthquakes. New Zealand is a highly tectonic region, and uh, the focus of our attention is going to be to Christchurch, which is located on the South Island of New Zealand. It is the second largest city of New Zealand with a population of approximately 400,000 people. And as you can see, uh, an urban area, it is quite spacious, 450 square kilometers, recently developed over the 100, 150 years, so established in 1850. So the outline of the talk, I'm first going to provide some background about the earthquakes themselves and we'll develop some context of liquefaction effects. Then we'll define the key features of Christchurch liquefaction in general terms, and then we'll provide some detailed impacts of liquefaction on residential land and buildings, infrastructure, and uh, multi-story buildings, with eventually a brief concluding remarks. So first, let's go through the background of the Christchurch earthquakes and set the scene. Well, Christchurch is located on the Canterbury Plains, as you can see them there, to the west are the Alps, and uh, there are two big rivers that you can locate immediately. To the right side, the white boundary is showing the area of Christchurch, and the uh, white square is the central business district where the multi-story and business uh, district was located, including the cultural activities of the city. The first key, uh, key feature to notice is that uh, we had a number of earthquakes and they were all located very close to the city. So the first event occurred on 4th of September 2010 with a complex system of faults located approximately 20 kilometers from the CBD. It was, uh, it was quite a strong shake. Significant damage was induced to the city, including liquefaction but there were no fatalities in that event. It was magnitude 7.1 earthquake. It was then followed by the most devastating 22nd February 2011 earthquake, magnitude 6.2, but as you can see, located within the city boundaries, very short distances to the urban area, and unfortunately 185 fatalities were in that event. <coughs> it was massive devastation, as you will see, including a very severe and widespread liquefaction. The third event was a few months later, 13th of June 2011, again within the city boundaries, magnitude 6 and 5.3, a couple of events, followed by the last in the sequence on 23rd of December 2011. Again, magnitudes close to 6. So a very brief summary and important thing to mention here is that we've got a very large magnitude earthquakes, which are uh, destructive, 7.2 to 7.1, sorry, 6.2 to 7.1, with a side to short distance extremely short, 0 to 5 kilometers from most of the city, and there were multiple events, so we had four very strong shakes occurring within a year or so. Well, let's see now what's the general geology of Christchurch. This is a, 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 a cross section across the city. And you can see now on the left-hand side are, are the Alps, going gently towards the, the, the city and the sea. The city is built and the plains are consist of very thick deposits of gravels, sands, silts, and then again clays, and then again gravels, sands, silts, and clays. So you have 
400 meters to one kilometer thick deposits like that on top of the plains. The gravels are actually aquifers, and there is a lot of water supply from the Alps going through these gravelly layers that are eventually discharged in the sea. And Christchurch has a, a, an excellent water. There are about 10,000 wells sunk in that area. So one important feature here to mention is that uh, because of this very large depth to the bedrock, these soils are covering the bedrocks and they are obscuring any false manifestation. So all the faults were hidden and were, for that reason, unknown. There is that uh, alluvial soil deposit, which is somewhere between 5 to 10 meters thick on the western perimeter of the city and is gradually increasing to 20 meters in the central area of the city and then further to 40 meters in the eastern part of the city at the coastline. These soils are of fluvial origin, deposited by, by rivers, so they are very loosely deposited. That is one important feature. They are composed of soils that are highly liquefiable, so we are talking sands, silts, some mixtures of gravels, sands, and silts. They are highly saturated, as we are going to see shortly, and this environment creates a lot of spatial variability, so you have vastly different soils from here to 50 meters away. This is showing the depth to groundwater table. And in Christchurch, it's very shallow. Most of the city is actually with a water table from one to two, three meters depth. That creates really a very high potential for liquefaction because the soils are fully saturated. This is how we describe in our New Zealand guidelines the typical geomorphologies that are with high susceptibility for liquefaction, river meander and point bar deposits, some estuarine deposits, backwater deposits, old river channels, former ponds and swamps, reclamation fills. The common feature for all of these is they have very loose deposits. That means they are with high potential for liquefaction. They have also fluvial deposition, which means the fabric is particularly weak to cyclic loading, so liquefaction can be easily produced, and they are also young. So they don't have any aging effects, they don't have over-consolidation effects. So all of this is pointing out to a very high potential for this kind of sites. And unfortunately, Christchurch ticks too many of these boxes here, so Christchurch is really with a very high liquefaction potential. So if I need to summarize the critical impacts of the Christchurch earthquakes, then liquefaction was obviously a major feature because it was devastating. So what you're seeing at the top left figure is a suburb of residential, uh, uh, is a residential suburb after the June event. And you can see the, the massive flooding that the liquefaction caused. Half of the city area was affected by liquefaction. The key point here is that liquefaction was occurring in an urban setting. It was not somewhere in the field. The second significant impact was the, were the rockfalls and uh, slope instabilities that occurred along the perimeter. There were much few res residents affected by this, but these were extremely difficult to deal with because you have unstable slopes affecting houses sitting on the top of the hills as well as, well, as, well as houses at the foothill, and it took quite some time to actually decide what to do with those. The final major impact was the closure of the CBD. There were many buildings heavily damaged in the CBD. Two unfortunately collapsed, and they were the reason for the fatalities, most of the fatalities. Because of the large destruction and damage to the buildings, many of those had to be demolished. And for that reason, the whole CBD was cordoned off for two and a half years. So you can imagine how the city lost the, the heart in terms of the business and, and cultural activities, and that dramatically affected everything. I have to say that Christchurch showed to be very resilient because businesses moved away at the perimeters and they restarted quite quickly. So in that sense, there are many positive stories out of these events. Again, we have to put this in the context. There were multiple events. I've mentioned four major earthquakes. And of course, the most critical impact were the 185 fatalities. 
So the first message I want to send here is that earthquakes have to be put in context and liquefaction impacts as well. In for Christchurch, the context is this one. So we have got very close sources producing very strong earthquakes, and there was a particular timeline. The faults were unzipping through the city, so we were getting these earthquakes every third or four month. The geological and ground environment were extremely important for the liquefaction that occurred. With the aquifers, artesian pressures, higher water table, and just having the soil composition and state of the soil ideal for developing liquefaction. And then on top of that, you have to put your built environment. The built environment of New Zealand is specific to that country. It does have certain construction practices, certain materials. And obviously, the whole impact, the most important, is on people. And people resilience and expectations are, again, very much associated with certain society. So we have to put all these liquefaction effects that I'm discussing in that context. So let's see what were the general features of the Christchurch liquefaction. First of all, I'm going to focus on the February event, which, is, which was the one with the most devastating consequences. As you can see here, the, the red square is a rectangular, is indicating the area of the source. It is within the city, producing extremely high accelerations. Uh, on the order of 0.5 to 0.7 G for the central area of Christchurch, and indeed, throughout half of the city, the demand was extremely high. The demand was high for liquefaction as well. We commonly measured that by the cyclic stress ratio. So CSR was from 0.15 to 0.3. This is now a more specific measure of that demand relative to the design spectra that were used for buildings. So on the left-hand side, if you look, there is a uh, dashed line for soil type D that is showing the design spectrum for the buildings in Christchurch that was used to develop all those buildings. The blue line is the actual demand caused by the earthquake showing that the demand was maybe two times higher than the design, uh, design specification. So clearly you would expect significant damage to buildings. On the right hand side, we are having a typical liquefaction evaluation chart where the line is showing resistance of soils. And we can see that that solid line is well below the demand of 0.15 to 0.3 for loose to medium dense soil. So you would expect loose to medium dense soils to have liquefied because the demand was far exceeding the capacity. And indeed, we saw lots of liquefaction. So this is the, these are the areas covered by severe liquefaction showed in red and magenta throughout the eastern and central Christchurch, and yellow shows the areas of moderate liquefaction. Half of the city area was affected by liquefaction. And we are talking about very severe effects, as you can see here. These are sand boils shown in the effects of liquefaction on residential property in Christchurch. This is how most of the streets in the eastern suburbs of Christchurch looked after the event when cleanup of properties was taking part. As you can read at the bottom, approximately 500,000 tons of sand and silt ejected were removed in the cleanup, and only partial cleanup was actually done. So indeed, uh, not only widespread, but extreme severity of liquefaction over large areas of Christchurch. And this was not the only liquefaction. As I mentioned, there were several earthquakes. So this is what happened in February 2011. The white shaded areas are showing us the areas that liquefied in the preceding September 2000 event. In the June 2013, again, liquefaction occurred in certain areas. So we can see that, especially along the Avon River, multiple episodes of liquefaction occurred. And this is important to remember. Sites that have liquefied most likely are going to liquefy soon if you have recent events following the previous ones. This is, for example, a street in the Avon side. In the third sequence, earthquake in the sequence, during the June 2011, people still lived in that area. And at this point, this was nine months after the first earthquake, uh, 
residents as well as we who were both residents and researchers were tired of all these activities around reconnaissance. But anyway, we conducted reconnaissance, maybe this is two hours after the event. And what was interesting is that uh, while I was driving with the youth special vehicle to do the reconnaissance, on the bicycle, I found the representative of this Avonson suburb, the parliamentary representative who was going in the bi on the bicycle through this muddy water trying to see how his residents were doing in this critical time during the earthquakes. Now, I, let's see what was happening and what particular property to illustrate the severity of liquefaction effects and how you can have multiple uh, manifestation of liquefaction. This is how the back, uh, backyard of that property looked like after the first earthquake in 2010. They cleaned up the ejecta. Then the second earthquake occurred on the 22nd of February. And you can see a well-aligned crack from which the ejecta is coming. They cleaned up the property. On 16th of April, there was a small magnitude 5 earthquake, so a little bit of ejecta. They cleaned up the property. On 13th of June, another 5.3, 80 minutes later, a bigger one, 6, and again, liquefaction is occurring. So I think any doubters about real liquefaction will, will be pleased to understand that liquefaction is easily reoccurring at sites that, that previously suffered from liquefaction. So here is a, a summary of the impacts of, of liquefaction. In total, 60,000 residential properties were affected, 20,000 were severely affected, and 8,000 were abandoned. There was severe heat on infrastructure, horizontal infrastructure. For example, wastewater pipelines, 700 kilometers were seriously affected and either lost or had limited service. There was on average one break per kilometer for the portable water pipes, and there's are 4,000 kilometers of those pipes. In total, the damage to the horizontal infrastructure was on the order of 3 billion New Zealand dollars. It took that much, actually, to recover the system partially. Maybe it has been recovered to 80, 90 percent from the pre-earthquake state. And of course, there were significant uh, impacts on, on bridges and, and, and buildings. Apologies for the change in the format and the difficulty to follow and read through this. The total economic loss caused by the earthquakes was about 40 billion New Zealand dollars. About 50% of that is associated with liquefaction. So in terms of economic consequences, it is an extreme hazard. The good thing about liquefaction is that it doesn't kill people, usually. So there was not a single fatality associated with liquefaction. So let's see some of the details of the impacts of liquefaction on residential land and buildings. These are uh, typical New Zealand houses, timber houses on uh, simple foundations. And in areas that liquefied, the typical consequences were a lot of sand ejecta, sand boils affecting the property, and consequence movement of the house because of the ground distortion. So there was a differential settlement. And here you can see the severity of the ejecta, about half meter thick deposit of ejectic material, and a lot of ejecta actually flooding the houses themselves. The second major impact was lateral spreading. This is an aerial view showing uh, a building affected by lateral spreading. You can see large cracks. Those are indicating very, very large ground movements towards the river on the order of one meter or even more, with slightly less movements happening at the back. This is stretching the house and is trying to tear it apart. And obviously, lateral spreading was a very damaging phenomenon associated with liquefaction. You can see here cracks and their distribution along the Avon River. They are indicating that most of the lateral spreading indeed is occurring along waterways. And there are clear reasons for that, the free face at the, at the river, as well as the sloping ground towards the river. The third damaging effect of liquefaction, most damaging effect, was the subsidence. This map is showing uh, the subsidence after all four events across the city area. And notice here that the red color indicates subsidence on the order of half a meter to a meter. So those are huge movements. For example, in this 
suburb of Bexley, you can see that the subsidence was on the order of one meter. And this was one of the areas that was abandoned. So here is now the residential land damage as a summary. In blue areas, not much happened. In green areas, there was minor to moderate damage, land damage. In red areas, there was moderate to major land damage. And the black area is what we call the red zone. That is the abundant area. The government decided to, to uh, buy out all the properties there, and now is a government-owned land. There are no more houses there. All have been deconstructed. So that area has been abandoned for now. So this is a typical view of uh, New Zealand residential houses. They are one-story or two-story houses. Simple timber, very flexible structures that performed extremely well. There wasn't a single collapse of a house, so there wasn't anyone killed actually due to residential houses collapsing. They have very simple foundations, concrete slab, or perimeter footing with simple supports of the wooden floor as shown to the, rough, to the right on, on figure B. On the bottom part, you can see all sorts of different shapes and deformations that these houses suffered in the, area, in the areas that liquefied. Typically, there were cracks on the foundations. They had very little reinforcement, so this wasn't a surprise. The foundations were not designed to deal with uh, liquefaction effects and loads, and certainly not with lateral spreading forces. This map is now showing the summary of foundation damage to residential buildings. Again, you have different colored code, color code from uh, blue and, and green are no damage or minor damage, whereas the reddish or hot colors are showing significant damage. And you can see the major damage occurred in, in the red zone along the uh, Avon River. So following the earthquakes, the government decided to provide this uh, zoning of land. A zoning into three categories was done. The gray area is the TC1, technical category one. The yellow area is TC2. The blue one is TC3. And the red one is the red zone that was abandoned. You can see a lot of black dots there. Those are geotechnical investigations that were conducted after the events. There was huge amount of data collected after the earthquakes, and I'm going to say a few words about that in the next slide. But the important point to, to say here is that uh, New Zealand has very high levels of insurance. Probably 90% of residential buildings and buildings are insured. Now, the funny thing about New Zealand is that even land is insured. In the same way you insure a house, we insure land in that way. As a consequence, there was a hyperactivity from the insurance to clean up all those claims and provide what was granted by contracts. So this zoning was trying to address a number of issues. The key was really to provide guidance to authorities, engineers, builders, and insurance companies. So the technical categories were trying to classify zone, uh, land in different zones so that we have clear expectations what should be happening in future earthquakes. And in addition to that, they were specifying a particular foundation types and solutions for each category of land. So TC1 could use the old standards. Nothing new should be done there. TC2, the new guidelines shown here are going to be used. And if it is TC3, that is a very difficult situation where special investigations and design of foundations is needed. So this was then followed in the practice. In the process, about 20,000 CPTs were done, 4,000 boreholes, and 1,000 piezometers. Huge amount of data was collected, and it became immediately obvious that everyone should share this data. So the Canterbury Geotechnical Database was created where if you put your own data, you can use anyone else's data. And this was a huge success. Now, this has moved into New Zealand Geotechnical Database, and other cities are trying to follow the, the same logic. Quite often, we, we found that uh, we cannot get right information in our design. And obviously, sharing this kind of information is critically important for, for best design practices.
you can see the amounts of uploads and downloads from the database to the right. So let's go quickly through the impacts of liquefaction on horizontal infrastructure. A number of lifelines, such as the portable water system, wastewater system, the road network, the gas system, as well as the electrical power system were affected by liquefaction. They were affected very differently. So I will start with the good stories first. The gas distribution system, which you see there, practically went without any damage. And there are a couple of important reasons why that was the case. So first, it wasn't laid out in the worst affected areas. So the demand was slightly lower. However, the second very important reason is that it used P plastic uh, polyethylene pipes, medium density polyethylene pipes, that is MDPE acronym for, which are materials uh, providing very ductile pipelines. So PE can strain up to seven, eight percent without failure. They didn't have any weaknesses in the couplings. They, there was electrofusion was used to connect pipes. So the whole system was extremely flex flexible and could accommodate large deformations and movements due to liquefaction. Hence, there wasn't much damage on that one. The electrical power system also performed quite well because uh, they did a very good job in the years preceding the earthquakes. Though we are hearing now rumors that for maintenance, they spend much more than before the earthquake. So there is some long-term consequence in straining the system caused, the, caused by the earthquakes, which is manifested now as a long-term effect. The portable water pipe network is shown here and the key feature is that there are about 4,000 kilometers of submains and mains. They're very shallow. The pipes are typically half a meter to 80 centimeters deep in the ground. So that means even when there is a, a problem, you can fix it easily. So the portable water system was indeed restored very quickly. You can see that most of the red dots, areas of failure, occurred where liquefaction was observed, which is not a surprise. See, we were seeing a clear relationship between the liquefaction severity and damage to the system. 85% of the damage occurred in areas of liquefaction. There was clear difference between ductile pipelines, such as the PVC pipes, and brittle pipelines, such as those composed of asbestos cement, where you can see the rate of damage to the brittle pipes was on the order of five to 10 times of the flexible pipelines. <laughs> Details are very important. So the submains are composed of polyethylene, very flexible pipes. But then they were using some couplings to connect different pipes that didn't work well. So instead of, because electrofusion was difficult to conduct under the groundwater conditions in Chrysler and shallow groundwater, they used mechanical couplings that didn't work well. So most of the damage to the PE system was actually due to this failure of connections. So here is another view how pipes of different materials performed. Clear difference between flexible and brittle pipes where galvanized iron is having maybe 10 times more damage than uh, the PVC pipes. The lower part of the figure shows a clear relation between damage to the pipes and severity of liquefaction. The worst was hit the wastewater system for a number of reasons. First, that system com is composed of uh, materials of different age. On the left lower part, you can see a figure indicating the number of faults on the vertical axis versus the year laid of the pipe. And EW stands for ceramic pipes, earthenware. They suffered huge amount of failures. As you can see, the city was then using concrete pipes, then reinforced concrete with rubber ring, then new PVC. They're all reducing the damage. So with time, they were moving and changing to better materials. And you can see reduction in damage due to that kind of, of use of improved practices in construction and materials. You can, it is interesting that the distribution of these different materials is related to the 
city areas. So in the central area, you have the oldest pipes, and as you go towards the perimeter, the more and more new pipe materials are, are used, and that is reflected in the damage distribution as well. The wastewater pipes are located 1.5 to 3.5 meters deep, so they are much deeper, so it's very difficult to detect any damage. For that reason, they conducted a very comprehensive CCTV uh, camera inspections over 200 kilometers. They spent probably about $100 million on that one. They identified the range of, of types of defects that were occurring. They classified those with, into different structural scores. And then, and the, at the lower graph, you can see how the decision was made whether to repair or renew a particular pipe. So if the structural score was one, for example, 10% of those pipes were renewed and 90% were repaired. Once the structural score was eight or higher, they were renewing or replacing the pipe. So this is giving you an ind indication about repairability of pipes depending on the type of damage. Just a brief reference to this uh, map. This is liquefaction resistance index map that we produced immediately after the earthquakes on the request of SCIRT. Stronger Christchurch Infrastructure Rebuild Team was a special organization created to recover the infrastructure of Christchurch. And in May, they pretty much said, we are starting to spend $50 million every month to re repair this system. And we are doing exactly the same thing as before because liquefaction was not part of our design. So we need immediately to implement some liquefaction design consideration in the restoration of the system. And that is why this map was provided. It shows the liquefaction resistance index with particular design parameters that they should use in the design of the pipes. The key is that it was back calculated from observations. Two observations, liquefaction severity maps and recorded ground acceleration. So I think we should be using more of this direct information or observation from earthquakes to immediately produce some sort of maps that can be used in practice. Just a brief reference to the characteristic uh, effects of liquefaction on bridges. A number of bridges were affected by lateral spreading, and, and most of them were subjected to very large lateral displacements, which were then resisted by a very sturdy and strong superstructure, and this in turn created rotation of the abutments towards the river. A very characteristic damage mechanism associated with lateral spreading and short span strong deck bridges. So this is Anzac Bridge, which was uh, illustrating the typical effect where you can see a six degrees uh, rotation in the abutment. The point here is that there is a system response of the bridge deck, abutments, ground around, and piles. So we need to consider this uh, system response, and that can be specific to the structure that you have in the region of interest. And a very brief reference to CBD buildings. I think I have two slides there only. In the CBD, there was part of the CBD which was severely affected by liquefaction. You quickly find that there is reason for that, where you have old river channels and loosely deposited sands in those areas. And we have inspected a number of buildings in this region. And what you would commonly find is that there are very different ground conditions beneath the footprint of the building where part of it, it was subjected to shallow liquefaction, and as a consequence, there was a settlement of close to 30 centimeters at that corner. At the other part of the building, nothing really happened. So you have very large differential movements in the uh, soils immediately beneath the foundation, causing this kind of uh, distortion and effects on the superstructure. And concluding remarks, well, effects of liquefaction should be considered in the, in the context of the particular earthquake features, geological and geotechnical environment, as well as built environment that is affected by liquefaction. The most dramatic effects of liquefaction were uh, reflected in three forms. There was shallow liquefaction with ground distortion, including ejected the surface, affecting all buildings and infrastructure. Lateral spreading induced very large lateral ground movements that were obviously very difficult to, to deal with. And finally, there was a huge subsidence on the order of half a meter or a meter that increased the flooding hazard and created a serious long-term problem. 
In areas where these three were manifested strongly, practically the recovery was difficult, and those are the areas that were abandoned and the red residential zone was declared. We are seeing a number of characteristic damage patterns for bridges, for buildings, pipe, pipes, and uh, obviously there are a number of lessons that we are learning in terms of vulnerability of buildings and infrastructure to liquefaction effects. Finally, the inherited risk is always there. Uh, land was occupied where we didn't know much about earthquakes or liquefaction. We use foundations and materials that are not performing well, and they are obviously already there. So you have to deal with that inherited risk and understand what does it mean in the case of future hazards. Just a concluding slide to indicate uh, dramatic differences in terms of effects happening in Christchurch. Uh, so you're having here two characteristic profiles for crashers. To the left is a profile where you have continuous uniform sands up to 10 meters depth. On the right-hand side, you have a profile which is highly interbedded with sands and silt and non-liquefiable uh, non soils. Our simplified procedures would say that both are a problem. You should expect liquefaction in both cases. However, what we observed was very different. Actually, the manifestation of, of liquefaction was extremely se severe for the case A, for the uniform deposit, whereas not much was observed for the highly interbedded deposit. When you start digging into details, that is not a surprise. There are a number of elements telling you that you should be seeing less of an effect for the highly stratified deposit. Our simplified procedures are doing a good job in many cases, but they are for many other cases, oversimplistic. Quite often, they are on the conservative side, but we need to improve those details of our simplified procedures for modern design. Now, this is very important if you put it in the context of what I was talking about. Roads are near the surface. Here is your portable water zone. Here is your wastewater. And this is the influence zone for shallow foundations. So obviously, it's very important what is happening in the five, first three, four, five, six meters in terms of severity of effects. Obviously, if you have building on deep foundations, deep liquefaction is also important. But uh, for most of the structures, performance of near surface soils is uh, of greatest importance. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and acknowledge the contribution of uh, an army of students, I would say, collaboration from, from US. And obviously, the financial support was critically important to gather this information and knowledge. Thank you.